work with looking into the mind, ferreting out the causes of suffering, and figuring out how to put an end to them. It's very delicate work, very precise work. Which is why you have to get the mind very still in order to do it. It's like threading a needle. You hold your breath, get the rest of the body still, and then you can very carefully stick the end of the thread into the eye of the needle. But it requires more than just stillness. There has to be a sense of well-being as well. Because in the course of looking into the causes of suffering, you're going to start seeing some things you don't like to see. When different parts of the mind are working at cross-purposes, and how one of your desires for happiness may run up against another desire for happiness. which may not be especially open and above board. Because when you look at the mind, there are many different selves in the mind, many different ideas of who you are and what you want, clamoring for your attention at any one time. And they can pull you in all sorts of different directions. And there's some desires that you act on, but you don't feel very good about acting on them, and so you tend to hide them. And these are the ones that cause suffering. After all, the Buddha said, suffering comes from the clinging aggregates. And the clinging aggregates are also what we create our sense of who we are out of, our sense of I am this or I am that can be centered around form, or feeling, or perception, thought constructs, or consciousness. And as soon as we slap the label of I am this or I am that onto something, we're going to cling to it. And there you are, suffering. Suffering is bound up in how we define ourselves. And when we start trying to ferret out the causes of suffering, we're going to find part of ourselves being attacked. They're going to fight back. And so you've got to, have a, got to have a strategy. Some of the Forest of Giants talk about this as like going into a, a ring with a prize fighter. You've got this enemy you've got to figure out how to attack. Other giants say, well, actually, you have to learn how to win the enemy over. Use whatever strategies you can to take your defilements and make them work for you. And both analogies are right. This is a fight. You can't let down your guard. You've got to be careful at all times. But at the same time, you'll find that the, the lines dividing you from your enemy shift around quite a lot. As the Buddha said, if there weren't any pleasure in the five aggregates, we wouldn't hold on to them. Sometimes you hear scholarly monks explaining things. There are the five aggregates, and you hold on to them, but you really, if you look at them carefully, they're not worth claiming as yourself. See, they change. You can't hold on to your form, you can't hold on to feelings, perceptions, thought constructs, consciousness. Understand? It's all very logical. As if all you have to do is have it explained to you once, and that would be enough to say, oh, I made a mis category mistake. Well, I won't make that again. If your idea of self were totally suffering, you wouldn't hold on to it. 
The problem is that it also gives you a certain amount of pleasure. Part of this is because your strategy is for happiness. Your sense of who you are is very important to a lot of your strategies for happiness. Figure out what's under your control that you can manipulate so you can provide for your happiness. Without that sense of control, you'd be totally lost, which is one of the reasons why we don't give in so easily when someone says, well, obviously the five aggregates are not self, so just stop calling them self and you'll be happy. The mind doesn't work that way. Part of it says, I'm being deprived of my strategies for happiness. How can I let go? And the Buddhist strategy is to say, well, teach you new strategies, new ways of looking at things. So you don't need all those unskillful ideas of self. But your sense of self is not a an abstraction. It's a particular strategy, and there's many different types of selves, and you're going to have to ferret them out one by one. This is what makes the problem difficult in some ways. You can't just cut one sense of self and be done with it. But on the other hand, it means that there are these individual senses of self, and they're not as big as you might have thought they were. Each one is a particular strategy, and when you can see the strategy and work and see that it's not really worth that particular type of effort. In other words, the happiness it leads to is not worth all the effort involved. You learn how to drop that particular strategy. So this is part of the solution, is learning how to take this big problem, suffering with a capital S, self with a capital S, and break it down into little pieces that you can observe and you can learn how to understand. And in each case, it involves seeing this particular pattern arise, watching it pass away. So you see that it is an individual pattern. It is an event that you can encompass in your awareness. If the problem is too big, suffering with a capital S or negativity with a capital N, it seems so large that you can never get your mind around it. But when you see that it's made up of specific events, specific choices in the mind. You can watch the choices and then watch to see where they lead. So that's the first thing, see them arise, see them pass away, so you know that they come and they go, and they are individual events. The next thing to look for is their allure, and this is one of the harder parts, because many times the allure is something we don't like to admit to ourselves. For instance, if we have low self-esteem, on the surface it would seem, who would want to deal with thoughts of low self-esteem? Who would want to entertain them? They're so debilitating. But they have their upside. If other people seem to have a low opinion of you, that means not much is expected of you. You don't have to work too hard. So that is their upside, and part of us likes that. But then you have to ask yourself, is it really worth it? Lowering your expectations means, of course, that the happiness you're going to gain is lower as well. So even though it may mean less is expected of you, less effort is going to have to be put into doing anything well, because after all, nobody really expects you to do it well. But then you don't get the results of having done anything well, either. This is a problem that many of us face as we get into the practice. We realize this is going to be a demanding project. It's going to ask a lot of us. We tell us, I don't want to take on anything that large. Then we go back to areas where not so much is asked of me. 
But then you've got to remind yourself you're turning your back on the possibility for a deathless happiness. Is it worth it? Can you live with yourself knowing that the possibility is there and you don't you don't want to tackle it? You've lived a life of a human being and yet you didn't look for the highest happiness that a human being can find. So you've got to weigh these things in your mind. Look at the allure of that particular mind state and then look at its drawbacks. And you see nine times out of ten that the drawbacks outweigh the allure. It's just not worth it. What is worth it is the effort that's put into the path. This is why the Buddha was so precise and spent so much time talking on about this particular noble truth. Because this is a, a path of effort that does yield good results, way in excess of the effort that goes into it. And so you want to be very clear about what you can do to build up the mind, to build up its strength, to build up its capabilities. So it can keep open that possibility of a deathless happiness. This is the other side of the equation in this battle we have with negativity. Part of the issue is learning how to break the enemy down into little individual events. And the other part is learning that you've got lots of potential tools. You're not defenseless. It starts with the breath. As the Buddha says, you learn how to breathe in different ways. So the breath becomes an ally in that your battle with negativity, negative mind states. You learn how to breathe aware of the whole body. You learn how to calm the sensations of breathing in the body so there's a sense of ease and refreshment. That right there gives you a big ally. So that when you feel tired and overwhelmed, you can rest and gain your strength. When pain comes into the body, you've got an ally in dealing with the pain. When negative thoughts come into the mind, you've got an ally in dealing with them. And that which you can take your stance here in the body. And even though angry thoughts may be roiling through the mind, they don't have to go roiling through your body. You can consciously keep that awareness of the breath, whole body breathing, calm breathing, full, refreshed, easeful. And that way you've got your allies in the fight. So the parts that you've been identifying with, the negative thoughts, they begin to lose their appeal. You realize that you don't have to identify with them and you don't really want to either, once you really take a good look at them. The other night I was reading a passage from Ubhaska Ki in Thai, where she was saying, when real insight comes, it's not a matter of the insight comes and then you decide to let go. The insight comes and it's, there's a letting go right at the same moment. If you fully understand that this habit you've had, that you've identified as part of your arsenal, part of yourself, leads to bad results. And you can develop other habits in its place. Once you really see that, you let go. It's like knowing that you, if you stick your finger into a flame, it's going to hurt. But you don't have to stick your finger. You pull it out immediately. That's it. And you never put your finger into a fire again. So as negative thoughts come in and seem to take over the mind, keep reminding yourself they are individual negative thoughts. And you can deal with them on that level. Beware of the tendency to deal in large abstractions. Because that's part of their guise. That's how they come in and push their way into the mind. 
and making themselves look big. So keep reminding yourself they're just individual events in the mind. And also remind yourself that you've got the tools you need in terms of the concentration, the ease, the well-being that comes from getting the mind to settle down with the breath and getting the breath to fill the body. And that's only one of many allies that you can call on, one of many skills that you can master. So you can unlearn your old habits and replace them with skillful habits. That your sense of well-being, your desire for happiness isn't so divided and conflicted. It's all open and above board, and it's focused on one thing. There's a famous thinker, Kierkegaard, who said, purity of heart is to will one thing. And the principle, in general, applies to Buddhism as well. You will the end of happiness. You, wow. you will the end of suffering. You will the end of ordinary happiness by looking for a higher happiness. You keep that aim in mind, and you learn to identify any thought in the mind that goes against that as a traitor. It's, but it's not a traitor in the sense of being evil, it's just misguided. You can reason out whatever train of thought led in that direction, and you can point out to the mind that it really is not in your own best interest. And you do this with each instance as it comes, not in the general sense of, well, if it's stressful, it's not, it's stressful, it's not self, and that's the end of the matter. That's not the end of the matter, because you have so many self-strategies and you've got to unlearn them all, all the unskillful ones. So you take them on one at a time. And ultimately you find that there are not so many that they're beyond your powers of mastering them. You can master them all, but it requires a willingness to take them on one at a time and to be very patient and persistent, drawing on the strength that comes from the concentration that you can do this. That's how you come out winning in the end.